Analytical techniques like NMR spectroscopy and mass spectrometry are really useful for determining the structure of an unknown molecule. Infrared spectroscopy doesn't really give us that kind of information. However, what it does really well is tell us about what kind of bonds are present. This is because covalent bonds can absorb infrared radiation. Just like visible light, infrared radiation has a spectrum with a range of frequencies. Different types of bonds absorb different frequencies of infrared, causing them to vibrate. Some bonds actually don't absorb infrared at all, but we'll come on to why that is later in the video. There are a couple of ways to prepare a sample for an IR spectrum. We can't put our sample in a glass container because glass absorbs in the infrared spectrum. It would be like trying to take a photo through frosted glass. Instead, we use cells with metal salt windows, such as sodium chloride or potassium bromide. Depending on what our sample is, we can either dissolve it in a solvent such as chloroform, press it into a transparent disc with powdered potassium bromide, or grind it into an oily slurry called a mull with a hydrocarbon oil called nujol. Infrared spectroscopy is a relatively simple technique. When we run an IR spectrum, we pass a beam of infrared radiation through a sample. The beam then hits a detector, which is located on the other side of the sample. This detector measures the transmittance, or in other words, the percentage of IR that's still present after passing through the sample. A transmittance of 100% means that none of the beam was absorbed by the bonds in the sample, and so all of it hit the detector. A transmittance of 0% means all of the beam was absorbed by the bonds in the sample, so none of it hit the detector. Over time, we scan through different frequencies of IR radiation until we've gone through the whole IR spectrum. Depending on what bonds are present in the sample, different frequencies of IR radiation will be absorbed, so we see these inverted peaks across the spectrum. We call these inverted peaks absorption bands. The frequency along the x-axis of the spectrum is measured in inverse centimeters, or centimeters to the minus one. You'll often see this axis labeled as wave number, which essentially means the number of oscillations per centimeter. This is directly proportional to the energy of the radiation, so high values of wave number correspond to high energies, and low values of wave number correspond to low energies. Notice that the scale runs backwards, with the smaller numbers on the right and the larger numbers on the left. Also notice that the scale changes at 2000 centimeters to the minus one, so that the right-hand side of the spectrum is more detailed than the left. We'll come on to why this is later in the video. Earlier, I mentioned that some bonds actually don't absorb infrared at all. The reason is, in order for a bond to absorb infrared radiation, its vibration must result in a change in dipole moment. Let's consider two diatomic molecules, hydrogen, H2, and hydrogen bromide, HBr. With the hydrogen molecule, the two hydrogen atoms are identical, and hence they have identical electronegativities. This means they both attract the bonding pair of electrons equally, and so there's no dipole across the molecule. However, bromine is more electronegative than hydrogen, so in hydrogen bromide, the electrons in the bond will be pulled closer to the bromine atom. This leaves us with what's known as a dipole moment across the bond. The size of the dipole depends on two things the magnitude of the difference between the two charges, and the distance between the two charge centers. Now, what would happen if these two molecules were to start vibrating? In the hydrogen molecule, this would have no effect on any dipole since there wasn't one to start with. Even when we're moving the atoms, there's still no distribution of charge. This means that there's no change in dipole moment, so hydrogen gas will not give an infrared spectrum. In the hydrogen bromide molecule, however, as the atoms move away and towards each other, the distance between the two centers of charge increases and decreases. This does result in a change in dipole moment, and hence this bond will absorb infrared radiation and give rise to an infrared spectrum. So, a change in dipole moment is necessary for a bond to show up in an IR spectrum. Now let's talk about molecular vibrations. A vibrating bond behaves just like two masses connected by a spring. If we look at a diatomic molecule like hydrogen, there's only one possible type of vibration, a stretching vibration. But if we look at something a bit more complicated, such as an amine group, there are more possibilities. The nitrogen-hydrogen bonds can stretch in phase, which is known as a symmetric stretch. They can also stretch out of phase, which is known as an antisymmetric stretch. Antisymmetric vibrations require more energy and appear at slightly higher frequencies than symmetric stretches. Apart from stretching vibrations, we can also get bending vibrations. The nitrogen-hydrogen bonds can bend in the same direction, known as rocking, or they can bend in opposite directions, known as scissoring. 
Another thing that's worth mentioning is that these bending vibrations tend to be found at lower frequencies than stretching vibrations. This makes sense when we think about it. Would it be easier to bend an iron bar or to stretch it? Since bending is easier, it requires less energy and hence the absorptions are observed at lower frequencies. Let's go back to stretching vibrations. There are two factors that affect the frequency of a vibration. The first factor is the mass of the atoms. Heavier atoms vibrate slower than lighter atoms. So, if we look at the bonds between carbon and various atoms of increasing mass, we can see that the bonds to lighter atoms result in absorptions at higher IR frequencies. In other words, more energy is required to excite these bonds to the more energetic, higher frequency vibrations. The second factor that affects the frequency of a bond vibration is the strength of the bond. We can think of a stronger bond like a stiffer spring, which will vibrate faster than a looser spring. We can see this in action if we compare the IR absorptions for a carbon-carbon single bond, double bond, and triple bond. Here, the masses of the atoms are constant, but the strength of the bond varies. The stronger the bond, the higher the IR frequency. Again, this means that more energy is required to excite the bonds to the more energetic, higher frequency vibrations. So, the atomic mass and the bond strength both influence the frequency of the absorption. For this reason, an IR spectrum can be very roughly split into four sections. Absorptions in the region 4000 to 3000 are typically due to bonds to hydrogen. This is because hydrogen is the lightest element, and as we know, lighter atoms result in higher frequency vibrations. Absorptions in the region 3000 to 2000 are typically due to triple bonds. These will involve heavier atoms than hydrogen, so they'll vibrate at slightly lower frequency than those bonds. But remember, the second factor that affects the frequency of a bond vibration is the strength of the bond. Triple bonds are strong, so they vibrate at relatively high frequencies. Absorptions in the region 2000 to 1500 are typically due to double bonds, which have a lower frequency than triple bonds since they're weaker. Finally, absorptions in the region 1500 to 500 are typically due to single bonds that don't include hydrogen. These have the lowest frequency as they're the weakest in comparison to the rest. So, we've talked about what determines the position of an absorption band. Now, let's talk about the factors that influence what the absorption band looks like. Different bonds can absorb different amounts of IR radiation, so their absorption bands can have different intensities. A high intensity means the bond has absorbed a higher percentage of IR, and a low intensity means the bond has absorbed a lower percentage of IR. This is known as the strength of the absorption, not to be confused with the strength of the bond. In the literature, absorption bands can be described as strong, medium, weak, or variable, and are usually given the letters S, M, W, or V to indicate this. The factor that affects the strength of the absorption is the extent to which the dipole changes. A larger change in dipole leads to a stronger absorption. A smaller change in dipole leads to a weaker absorption. No change in dipole leads to no absorption at all, as we discussed earlier in the video. So, more polar bonds tend to result in stronger absorptions than less polar bonds. The other thing to consider is the width of the absorption band. If we're looking at the IR spectrum for an alcohol, we can see that the absorption band for the OH bond is quite wide. We call this a broad absorption. The broadening of OH absorption bands is due to hydrogen bonding. Alcohol molecules have quite intricate hydrogen bonding between them. These hydrogen bonds lengthen and weaken the OH bonds in the alcohol molecules to varying extents, so there will be a wide range of stretching frequencies all distributed about a mean value. This is why alcohol OH absorption bands are broad in the IR spectrum. You may be wondering why NH bonds aren't broad, even though they exhibit hydrogen bonding as well. The reason for this is that the hydrogen bonding that stems from NH bonds is weaker compared to the hydrogen bonding that stems from OH bonds. This can be explained by the electronegativities of nitrogen and oxygen. Oxygen and hydrogen have a much larger difference in their electronegativities, so the OH bond is a lot more polar, leading to stronger hydrogen bonding, which gives rise to broader absorption bands in the IR spectrum. In molecules like butylated hydroxytoluene, the bulky alkyl groups on either side of the OH group prevent the molecules from getting close enough to establish any hydrogen bonding, so the OH absorption for this molecule is sharp, rather than broad. So, when looking at IR spectra, the position of an absorption band depends on the atomic masses and the bond strength. The strength of the absorption depends on the extent of the change in dipole moment, and the width of the band depends on the amount of hydrogen bonding. The region below 1500 is where the spectrum starts to get messier. 
It's much harder to assign individual peaks in this region, but the arrangement of the peaks here are usually unique for a given molecule, just like a person's fingerprint. For this reason, we call this part of the spectrum the fingerprint region. We can use this to compare against other spectra to help us confirm the identity of a given molecule. This is why the scale changes along the x-axis, to allow us to see the fingerprint region in more detail. So, even though IR spectroscopy doesn't really give us structural information in the same way NMR spectroscopy or mass spectrometry does, it gives us a lot of information about any functional groups present. This, combined with analysis of the fingerprint region, can help us quickly and easily identify unknown samples. If you enjoyed this video and would like to support the channel, please consider subscribing, and make sure to let me know in the comments if you have any questions.